And now finally, I pass the word to Rolf. You're muted. You're muted, Aaron. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, great, okay. yes. Sorry about that. I had to find the way out here again. Okay. It looks like you've been in the home office, right? Yes, I'm I'm pretty digital nomad right now still. <laughs> <laughs> nice okay. to have you. Welcome. So so um I will speak a bit more about how the uh, public sector is supporting a lot of um and AI and um, technologies. And uh, I will give in the following, hopefully, three examples um, uh, where we are working on. But let me first start, since I guess that not all of you will be so much um, familiar with bioinformatics, but could I give you first an overview uh, what we are. So I'm director of um, EMBL's European Bioinformatics Institute in, in uh, Cambridge, and EMBL is an international uh, research organization, intergovernmental research organization, with six sites in, in um, um, five different countries. And the headquarters are in Heidelberg, and as I said, I'm running the, together with my friend and colleague, Ewan Burney, uh, the EMBL EBI in, in Hinks, which, which is near Cambridge in, in the UK. So our mission at, at EBI is really to deliver data resources for the life scientists, um, perform research, train the next generation of scientists, engage with industry and coordinate bioinformatics provision, uh, the research infrastructure provision in Europe. And what that, does that mean? Well, what we do is we scientists generate data all over the world and make discoveries. We, they deposit it at EMBL EBI at latest at the time on, of publication. We archive and share it with global collaborators and all scientists in the world who are interested in that. We classify, enrich, combine, and analyze the data. We distribute both the raw and value-added uh, data resources. Scientists use it, uh, again, to design new experiments on the basis of shared uh, global knowledge. And then the cycle starts again. And since, you, as I said, I don't expect that you know much about my field. So we are one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, provider of such type of data in the world. There are 107 million daily web requests to our websites from 41 million different unique IP addresses uh, per year. Every five minutes, uh, a scientific article is published that cites uh, our data. And uh, every three seconds, we receive new data sets, uh, ma uh, mainly from sequencing runs or analysis. So the beauty of this is, of course, this data is all freely and openly available to everyone who wants to use it. And the, um, the, there was a big breakthrough just recently in uh, protein pr uh, structure prediction. So how to go from a string of letters from the genome to the protein uh, uh, amino acids to understanding, predicting the, the protein structure without doing uh, X-ray crystallography or, or electron microscopy uh, information. And as you can see in this, this graph here, the, the, the quality of such predictions was hovering around 40% um, for many, many years in, in the so-called CASC uh, competition. And then DeepMind came on uh, with their AlphaFold uh, work. And in 2018, they jumped to nearly 60%. And then there was a giant leap in 2020 when AlphaFold 2 really niched, reached nearly 90% of uh, prediction accuracy in, in this competition. And that was a, a great thing. It was an, an incredible breakthrough uh, for structural biology and the life sciences overall. And Alphafold then contacted us and said, look, this work wouldn't have been possible with all the data which you have in the protein structure database and in the Uniprot database. That, is the, that was the, the basis of how we uh, were able to do these predictions because you had this fa um, fundamental training material for us. 
So we would like to work with you to bring um, this database and the predictions then to the public. So in, uh, we dis started discussing uh, in at the 30th of March, 2021, we, we, uh, a decision was made to establish the AlphaFold database and to follow the so-called FAIR data principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and provide open access to AlphaFold model uh, coordinates. On the 13th of April, we had established uh, at EBI a team uh, on the 1st of May, uh, the first data files uh, were um, coming, and uh, in, at the 22nd of July, we, we launched the, the database. And that sounds probably a bit boring, but the, the real great thing is that at the, um, in the first release, we had around 365,000 uh, uh, prediction models in there for 2 to 1 uh, proteomes. And to put that into perspective, there are probably only around 200,000 or so structurally different proteins out there in the world, which have some biochemical uh, or uh, biochemical information which is used by the life scientists. The rest are all predictions based on, on this functionally characterized uh, proteins. And already in, in, um, in version two, we went to um, 800,000 models in version three. We structured on, um, uh, in addition to these, uh, to the high quality protein data we had already on pathogens and neglected diseases. We went to the WHO to ask them which uh, protein, proteins and proteomes we should um, um, uh, prioritize. And they gave us a list of 49 different uh, um, uh, pathogens. And uh, we went to 1 million. Uh, and by the end of um, uh, this year, we still are on track to have 100 million different models of different proteins. Um, and that covers really all the known protein space there is right now. Uh, that's uh, uh, pretty uh, amazing. And the impact is, is um, immense because now the 3D structures for virtually all of the human proteins are there. Um, and there is a much easier way to, to look at how certain variation in a human genome of an individual leads then to structural changes. So you can follow now the whole change, or you see a variant here which changes the amino acid uh, sequence in this protein, and it has the following impact on, on, the, um, on the protein. That will, that it makes huge changes in drug discovery and, um, um, and, um, and assessment of, of um, uh, disease impact. So the new normal for biology is that, that we can now study a lot of proteins starting with a 3D model as the basis for hypothesis. Does this model explain previously known data on function binding specificity? And we can design now experiments based on the model, for example, introducing uh, uh, mutations uh, to see what's, how that changes. So this is an open, uh, this allows now open access to uh, all of this data, but the open access to the macromolecular structure and sequence data beforehand was the key to recent, uh, these recent advances in structure prediction. And we really are now moving into a new era of biology at both molecular and cellular level, thanks to, to this data. This advance in structure prediction will really drive uh, a data-driven revolution in biology and medicine and transform basic and translational research in life sciences in the coming um, uh, decades. So another example, how we try to put together data um, uh, with, with companies uh, for, well, both benefiting these companies, but also benefiting uh, uh, the life science community at large, because all the data we generate in collaboration with someone needs to go into the public domain. So that is uh, Open Targets, a partnership to transform drug discovery through the systematic identification and prioritization of targets. The academic partners are us and uh, the Senge Institute, uh, I was the director of Open Targets for a year, um, and, it, and uh, was the person uh, uh, starting this as conceptually. Um, the industry partners right now are GlaxoSmithKline, Bristol Myers Squibb, um, Sanofi, and Pfizer. And what are we doing there? We try to link targets and diseases to make uh, safe and effective medicines um, uh, easier by finding the potential drug targets. So. 
we have joined project teams and shared platforms with uh, the academic and industrial partners. Um, what we do is we systematically use evidence to build therapeutic, um, oh, sorry, that was one too fast, um, to build um, therapeutic hypothesis between uh, targets and disease. We go from public available data and from uh, new data we generate really on a, a genome-wide basis. Um, the, the design and prioritization of the program uh, is co collaboratively. Everyone needs to engage uh, actively in the research program. And then we, we uh, move from this public data and the collaborative uh, therapeutic uh, areas to, um, to move towards causal uh, target um, disease evidence and foundational knowledge from, from these data sources to build an integrative data platform pipelines. And then we select um, um, from through this engagement with world leading teams in genetics, functional genomics, and informatics to um, to the um, sorry to, to the um, selection of various targets which look very promising, and go then into further um, um, target validation uh, where the companies have then the option to raise IP and licenses to, to the consortium inventions. Um, but uh, that's um, all the data which is generated goes then really into the um, uh, public domain and uh, usually um, already before uh, publication, but latest at the time of publication. Um, I don't want to bore the more techie uh, audience here with the different uh, key experimental technologies there are, because it's more life science specific. Um, and uh, once just to uh, and with telling you a little bit about another uh, collaborative uh, project we are doing um, um, to demonstrate the value of uh, interactions of companies and, and uh, various academic partners, that's a European COVID-19 data platform. Uh, in uh, COVID, of course, kept us busy for quite a bit and um, uh, important in beating really as much the virus as much as possible was open and rapid access to data and workflows. Uh, so we built uh, um, this uh, um, this platform in April 2020 to collect as many data on, on COVID as possible. And as you know, um, all the vaccines needed to start somewhere with a uh, nucleotide sequence, uh, which we could find already in January 2020 in our database. And um, uh, the, the success was of this was phenomenal. But there are also other um, parts which, which need to uh, be worked on. So one thing is to, important to get the viral sequences, but also different humans react different both to the virus and to treatment by, by potential uh, drugs, but also by treatment with potential vaccines. And therefore, we also need to collect uh, as much of the human genetics data and phenotypic data as possible. So that's... Uh, in, uh, and then... There is, needs to be a lot of engagement and coordination worldwide to, to um, bring together as many data, as much data as possible from various countries. And you need to have a portal which allows you access to this. So what we do uh, for, uh, for mobilizing the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 data was uh, to use the so-called data hubs. It's a sort of um, a cloud environment where you can get a lot of data and, and compute in there, and you can create collaborative workspaces until you push it completely into the open. And from this, we also then um, uh, do systematic reanalysis of the data and, and do pu uh, public health reporting uh, in uh, fortnightly uh, snapshots. And the human data, we collect it uh, through a database called Human Genome. One minute left, Claude. Yeah, that's fine, no problem. Uh, human Genome Phenome Archive, um, and uh, that's uh, um, uh, the based on a federated data infrastructure, and we get both data from industry and from academia in here. Um, that is all pulled together, all types of data, viral sequences, genetics data, expression data, protein data, network data, biochemical data, samples, imaging data, and the literature into the COVID-19 uh, data platform. Uh, so far, we have around 220,000 uh, global users of the platform. Um, and millions of requests. Again, all of this data is publicly available. And 
um, oh, sorry, I, I was wrong. It's by now 340,000 users and 5.8 million visits, but it doesn't matter. I'm not quick enough in updating these things. Um, yeah, so the usage is um, completely open to everyone and heavily used. And since we are at the end of the time and it's a long day, it was a long day for all of you, I say thank you and any questions. Thank you very much, Rolf. Indeed, it was a long day, but a very insightful day. Um, let me ask you about your data hub, right? Uh, or the data layer, which is the base and the foundation for the model layer, right? To what extent do you need personal data? Because I think this is the most valuable data, because public data, is, it's, it's nice to have, but uh, you must scale in personal data. How do you do that? How big is the roadblock? So, so, so in the data hubs, we mobilize viral sequence data. So the only personal data is the data we try to filter out and throw away. So you get so-called uh, raw reads from the sequencing machine. And since you take samples from humans and try to find the RNA uh, of the virus, you always have also human data. And of course, this is um, the, the data you can't, make freely available without consent. So what we need to do, or our collaborators need to do in these data hubs, is to get rid of the reads before they push the viral sequences out. The interesting human data needs to go into the European Genome Phenome Archive, and where it's been in, in a controlled access way, but with, um, with the necessary consent uh, that can be given through a data access committee to researchers who want to work on that. If it comes all from one sample, you have at least then the knowledge of the viral sequence of the human genetics data, um, if there was consent for, for sequencing that, and um, at least some basic phenotypic uh, personal data, and then you can link that. This usually doesn't happen at the hub at our place. It happens, we have 10 national uh, co um, um, COVID hubs which are uh, COVID portals, where they bring together these type of data in their legislation and in their legislative and regulatory structure. It's very hard so far uh, in Europe to do that um, uh, across the countries. So they, we rely very much on our uh, national collaborators here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Very welcome.